Good morning. I don't usually stand before you with my mind a whirl of a lot of different things. I have a plan. I know where I'm going. But this is a hard sermon when you're going to talk about what's wrong in the world and stopping to gaze at it. So will you pray with me before I start? Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are never surprised by anything that happens in our lives and in the larger world around us. You're never wringing your hands and pacing the floor wondering what to do. I ask that your Holy Spirit would ultimately be the divine editor of my words today. And that you would touch our hearts for the brokenness of this world and use us as your light in the darkness. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. And so part of the problem with knowing six or seven weeks ago that I was given this topic of lamenting for the brokenness of this world, I really have been really intentional, I'm not sure I recommend this, um, about paying attention to what is broken in our world. Kind of every time I encountered brokenness. And even on our, we went on a vacation to Colorado last week to ski, which is our very favorite place. The mountains are the place where the holiness and the grandeur of the God we serve just screams at me. But even one night, we were, we're a group of 10 people and we went to dinner at this the nice restaurant. We, we cook for each other the rest of the week, so we, we do it on a shoestring, except this one night. We all go in this fancy restaurant, and um, there was our waitress, and she had an accent, and I always make a point to get to know our waiter or our waitresses and ask questions, and of course, she has an accent, and the, the obvious question is, where are you from? Um, it wasn't a y'all accent, and it wasn't a Colorado accent. <laughs> it was a Ukrainian accent. And she said, I came here three years ago from Ukraine. I said, do you still have family there? She said, yes. I said, are they safe? And she said, no one is safe in Ukraine. And there we were, 10 Southerners at a table in Colorado, coming face to face with the brokenness of our world. So let me back up. Lent is a time of fasting and self-examination with the realization, we're looking for the realization, of where have we stepped away from what Jesus has called us to do and be? And then our focus is on repentance, and we want to repent so that we can change the direction, the wayward direction we're going, and get back in line with what God is doing, what he is calling us to do. And I don't know anybody, no matter where you live, no matter what aisle that you lean on politically, I don't know anybody who wouldn't say that our world is in desperate need of change. Whether they're sitting in a pew, sitting in an office, sleeping under a bridge, or screaming for justice in the streets. The evidence that our world is broken and need of a change of direction is all around us. And the first step of that change of direction is lamenting. It's to grieve like God does for the sins, the brokenness of our world. And last week, and we need to grieve two ways. We need to grieve for our own brokenness, our own sin. But we also need to grieve for the brokenness of the world. For the young Ukrainian woman who served us that night, whose family is left in the Ukraine where no one is safe. And last week, Michael took us through Psalm 51, David's well-known psalm uh, that he wrote after his exposure of his sin with Bathsheba that was hurtful not only to him, but to many others. It's one thing to mourn our personal sin, to lament our personal sin. After all, I kind of can't run away from it. For a season, I might be able to deny it, but what is it they say when you keep changing jobs and you keep having the same problems in the jobs, perhaps the 
The problem is you. <laughs> you can't run away from yourself. And, and also, whose sin can I really change? Who can I really repent for? I, just me. So repenting for my own sin and brokenness is one thing. I know a number of us have been lamenting the war in Ukraine, but none of my friends have had an audience with Putin. <laughs> Things don't seem to be changing. So why lament for the sin and brokenness of our world? Ultimately, because it's our job. Ultimately, because if you're a follower of Jesus, you've been restored to the divine, the royal vocation given in Genesis 1 and 2. And part of that is to lament the brokenness of our world. And I'll return there in a minute. And I want to briefly look at three things. I'm aware of the time. And I have to be honest, after hearing her testimony, I thought, close your books, go home. Let's do the peace. Let's go to the table. Because the victory of God in the lives of people, there's no greater sermon. But I don't get to be in charge of the schedule. So, but I am aware of the time, so I promise I'll behave. But I really want to look at three things that lamenting is with the hope that um, I'll convince you that lamenting is your job. And second, that you will be strengthened in your resolve to do the hard work of lamenting for the brokenness of our world. But before I do that, I want to clear one thing up about what lamenting is not. It is not what we read in Exodus 17, 1 through 7, that the Israelites did in Rephidim when they wanted water. Complain. Lamenting is not complaining. There might be a lot to complain about, but lamenting is not complaining. Co a complaint is an accusation against God that maligns his character. A lament is an appeal to God based on confidence in his character. So the most important thing about our lamenting is first our theology. What do we believe about God and his character? So three things that lament is. And again, I'm hoping to convince you that one, it's our job, we, we got to do it, and two, that it will strengthen your resolve to do the difficult work of lamenting for the brokenness and sin in our world. So first, lament is a form of praise, which might seem really strange. But did you know the Hebrew word for the, for the Psalms, they, they have this word, it's tehillim, tehillim, Tehillim. And Tehillim actually means songs of praise. So they call that 150 book compilation of songs, all of them are Tehillim, songs of praise. And did you know that scholars have estimated that two thirds of those songs of praise fall into the category of lament? And so lament is a song of praise. Now, I mentioned this divine vocation a few minutes ago, this royal vocation given to us in Genesis 1 and 2. And so just to make sure we all exactly understand what that is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And into the very fiber of creation, he gave our creation everything it needed to flourish and to move forward. But he didn't set that on autopilot or automatic he set that up to be done when humanity partners with him to do his work in the world. But sadly, if you've ever read at least the first three chapters of the story, you know things went terribly wrong by Genesis 3. Humanity rebelled against the God of creation and said, no, thank you. I don't want your royal vocation that you've given me. I want to do it my way. Sin is sort of the word that all of that rebellion and re rejection of the royal vocation gets. It's sin kind of sums it all up. And what sin did is it unleashed chaos in the world. And it leads to death. 
But despite humanity's rebellion, rejection, Yahweh did not, or God, did not, I'm used to calling him Yahweh, we're studying in the Old Testament, and, you know, there's lots of gods in the biblical world in the story. You've got Egyptians have their gods, Assyrian have their gods, so we, we're always careful in class to identify which God we're talking about, Yahweh, the God of Israel, the one true creator God. So if I go back and forth, I'm sorry. Um, but God did not rescind the royal vocation he gave to humanity. Instead, he sent Jesus to rescue humanity so that we could re-enter that partnership with him and get about doing that work that is going to restore creation. So if we're followers of Jesus, we are supposed to be those renewed humans that are partnering with God to do his work in the world. And his work in the world, according to Genesis 1 and 2, has kind of two parts. The first part, as his image bears, is we reflect him in the world, which we use words like rule and reign and tend and care. It basically means that we're going to be the stewards of the world the way God would. We'll take care of the world around us and each other the way God takes care of the world and each other. That's the first part. But the second part is we get to reflect the praises of the world back to God. So as long as there is sin and brokenness, part of our praises are going to be laments for its brokenness. So lament is a praise that is in the fiber of our royal vocation, part of what we're called to do. Second, lament is a prayer for God to act. Lamenting is a uniquely Christian prayer form in which people look to God to help amid their sorrow. Lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust. Within the biblical narrative, those who follow Jesus are called children of God. This means that when we pray, we are praying not only to the king of the cosmos, one true creator God who is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. We are praying to our father, a loving father who is omnibenevolent, who is quite literally in the very fiber of his being, incapable of anything but his very best toward us. That's who we're praying to. And most of the laments in the Psalms, when you pay attention to them, move from the cry in the sorrow and the pain to a vow or a declaration of hope. Because why? Because as Beth said, when she shared the story of her granddaughter, we have confidence that the God who we call Father will act on our behalf. And not only that, we know because of Jesus, because of his being raised from the dead, that sorrow is not the end of the story. I'm just going to read a little bit of the end of the story for you from Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. In case you don't know this, in the biblical story, the sea is a metaphor for chaos. The sea is where evil comes from. And so when we're looking at the end of Revelation, at new creation, at the end of the story, the sea is gone because anything that would cause chaos, it's done. It's gone. It's not going to be there. But anyway... And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among his people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and he will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. No more mourning or crying or pain. There is no more curse to read on and skipping some verses. There's no more darkness or night. In fact, there's not even the sun because God is so bright. He is the light. 
It says the gates of the city don't ever close. If you know anything about ancient cities, the gates close to keep out what's bad, what's evil. Well, apparently nothing is bad or evil anymore, so the gates can stay open. And then the tree of life, it's back. With 12 different fruits for the healing of the nations. Not just the healing of you and me as individuals, but the healing of the nations, the brokenness of our world. So to be sure, lament is not our final prayer, but is the gift of a prayer for in the meantime, while we wait for the end of the story with a dare to hope. And finally, and this is perhaps the most uncomfortable part, lament is our opportunity to participate in the pain of others. Lamenting is not just for the one in pain. When we lament with those who are in pain, we show our solidarity with him. When God asked Cain, or when Cain asked God, am I my brother's keeper? The right answer was yes. Actually, you are. Humanity was supposed to take care of one another the way the God who created each one does. And when we push our chair up to the broken in our world, we do so with a light. We are the light of the world. And we bring this light into the dark places. It doesn't do much good here in this room full of light. But in the dark places, this is hope. And sitting and lamenting with the broken in this world is not comfortable. It's very, very costly. It might keep you awake at night. It might take you into places that you would have never gone. You might even feel like you're in danger sometimes. But it's our job. Y'all know the rest of the story of Lazarus from the Gospel John, but I asked us to stop at the place where Jesus wept. Now, there's about four ideas swirling around in commentaries about why Jesus wept. Let's just kind of whatever for just a moment. It's a great question. The Bible doesn't tell us, but it's a great question. But let's just stop for a minute and recognize that Jesus entered in to the suffering of those around him. He took a moment. He already said he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He's about to do it. He's on the precipice of the miracle that declares that I am Lord over death. But he stops to weep because our God laments over the brokenness of his world. And if we're going to be like him, if we're going to reflect him to a broken world, we got to go. We got to lament. It's our job. Jesus said in the Introduction to his great Sermon on the Mount, which I prefer to call his Kingdom Manifesto. And those uh, Beatitudes um, are just these shocking announcements of what uh, the Kingdom of God is like, who's in in the Kingdom, who will find the Kingdom to be a good place, and who might be kind of sad about things. But the second Beatitude is, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Nobody likes to mourn. Nobody likes to hang out with the depressed. 
Nobody likes to look into the face of brokenness. But that beatitude tells us that the kingdom of God does not think that mourning and lamenting and sorrow is something to be denied and pushed to the side. But it's a need that needs to be attended in the kingdom of God. And you and I are called to participate in the pain of this world through lamenting. May we have the grace and the courage to do that. Will you stand with me?